This morning, this, uh, this weekend's Torah portion is Barashat um, Chukat. Chukat is essentially chapter 19, 20, and 21 of the Book of Numbers. It begins with a very strange ritual called the Paraduma, the red heifer. Many people have heard of this ritual. It was an ancient ritual that, that purified people who had come into contact with death. And as if the Parsha itself needed the Paraduma, as if the Parsha, the portion needed the red heifer ashes, but the 19th chapter precedes um, the death of Miriam, the death of the amazing prophetess Miriam, older sister of Moses, the great heroine of the Torah without whom Moses would not have arrived in the palace of Pharaoh, the amazing Miriam who stood watch to make sure that her brother in his little basket, what would happen to him? And she, who I'm sure cried many tears, hoping that he would be safe, herself becomes the source of the living waters. The tradition teaches us that Miriam was the one responsible for the well of water that followed the Israelites in the desert. And of course, as soon as Miriam passes away in this week's Torah reading, in chapter 20, end of chapter 19, 20, there is no water for the people. The people begin to gather around Moses and Aaron saying, we need water, we're thirsty. And a very famous episode happens next where God tells Moses to speak to the rock. Take your staff, he says, and speak to the rock, and the rock will give forth waters. And Moses gathers the people around tells them, listen, you rebels, are we going to bring back, are we going to bring water from this rock? And then proceeds to hit the rock, not once, but twice. And of course, the, ward, the waters come, the floodgates open, there's enough water for all of the people. In the immediate aftermath of that moment, in a very terse one line, one sentence, Moses and Aaron are punished, and the punishment is harsh. God says, Yana Shalohemantin be you didn't believe in me, Lak Disheni, in order to sanctify me before the people of Israel, you will not enter the land. For a couple thousand years, the commentators have struggled with the immense dissonance between the punishment and the crime. Not only that, I would say more accurately, not only have they been troubled by the moral problem posed by a punishment so harsh, it's out of inconsistent or in, not in consonance with the crime, but they're not even sure what the crime is. Commentator after commentary, thousands and thousands of pages over the last 2,000 years are trying to figure out what exactly did Moses do wrong. God told him to take his staff. After all, he takes his staff wherever he goes. He speaks to the rock. Presumably, as Nachmanides says, even though God said, speak to the rock, he also told him to take his staff, and Moses should have, and understandably would have assumed that whenever he took his staff somewhere, he was supposed to use it. And not just that, it's, even if, if the sin, quote-unquote, Nachmanides says, is that he didn't speak to the rock, it's still a miracle. God says, you didn't sanctify my name. Okay, is it, Ramban says very beautifully, is it a much lesser miracle that he hit the rock and enough water for 600,000 people flowed? I don't think so. What exactly did Moshe do wrong? So I was thinking about this this week and, and I was learning it with someone, with my dear friend Rabbi Yaffa Epstein. And we were exploring Moshe's history of hitting things. The first moment where Moshe is introduced to the Jewish people, we're told in chapter 3 of the book of Exodus that he's in the palace of Pharaoh and he goes out to his brothers. Vayar b'siv lotam, and he saw them suffering and he went out to meet with them and he saw Vayar, he saw an Egyptian taskmaster beating a Jew and Moshe, Vayif and Kova Ko, Moshe looks around, Vayach et Mitzri, and he hits the Mitzri, when he killed him. 
When God tells Moshe to bring water in the very first moment after the Israelites are free, in the first year of the Exodus, he's told to hit the rock. God says, take your staff and hit the rock. Moshe seems to be someone who had a certain way in the world. He struggled, we're told from the text, with speaking, and he became a man who used force to some degree or some version of force in order to get what he needed. And maybe that worked, says Rabbi Moshe Weinberger, in the first year of the Israelites right, coming out of Egypt. They themselves knew a bit of harsh, a harsh approach to pedagogy and education. They were used to being hit. They were used to it. And maybe Moshe, knowing the people, felt that like them, he also had to learn, or maybe he knew it naturally because he couldn't speak and he was frustrated, whatever it might be, but he used force. And maybe in the first year of the Israelites leaving the land of Egypt, that might have been a useful pedagogical tool, maybe. But certainly at this point, Moshe should know that the leadership of one generation is not the same way to lead another generation. Moshe should know that leaders have to adapt, and the adaptive quality in the leader shows that they're able to read the people appropriately. And maybe Yaf and I were, were exploring, maybe Moshe failed to be an adaptive leader. That's one answer. Maybe Moshe, like leaders all around us, have a hard time seeing when the writing is on the wall, have a hard time knowing that the message that worked at one point is not the same message that we have to have going forward. Maybe Moshe failed in this test not because hitting or speaking really matters, but being able to shift from one to the other is really the key lesson in leadership. Moshe had become accustomed to one way of leading, and as they say in India, a pickpocket, when they look at someone, only see their pockets, or as we like to say, for someone who only has a hammer, everything, right, is a nail. It's the wrong instrument at the wrong moment, and Moshe couldn't adapt. That's one approach. Let's, let's do something a little bit less broad about me and you. A second possible answer. And I like this one because I, it feels very true to Moshe and to this moment. In a Parsha that deals deeply with death, in a Torah portion where Moshe loses arguably the most important mentor, his sister Miriam, we're not told that Aaron is a prophet, but Miriam is a prophet. And only she and her younger brother Moses sing a prophetic song in the Torah. Moshe and Miriam, his older sister, one can only imagine the kind of grief that he was holding at this moment in his life. And the text moves so quickly from her death into the story of the water. One can't but imagine that Moshe, who began his career hitting things, was surrounded by people who didn't know how to help him release his waters. Surrounded by people who didn't know how to hold him so that he could feel the grief that he was holding in his body and in his heart. We can only imagine that Moshe transformed his grief and his sadness into anger and rage. So uncharacteristic of Moshe to yell at the people the way that he did to not hear exactly what God had asked him to do. Those are characteristic features of someone who's so overwhelmed by grief, whose brain is so offline, who so needs not for the rock to bring water, but for these rocks to bring water. That Moshe, Moshe misses the moment because of an overwhelming inability, structurally, maybe interpersonally for him, to stop and feel. If you think this is of this moment, you'd be right. There are many who would say that we shouldn't focus on the, the affective, on the feeling state. 
But I challenge any one of us to imagine or to, to think into their own lives moments when they were holding an immense and enormous loss and grief and how it impacted your capacity to function. I challenge any one of us to imagine that immediately after losing someone who was so essential, so central, so vital, so much a part of how we saw the world and navigated it, that we might very, the very next moment be able to respond to all of the needs, the variegated needs of all of those people who were begging, demanding, and crutching to Moshe for their water. I was thinking a lot about this, Abby, because this week, you know, coming up to the Shiva at HIR, where you had the courage to stand in a circle of friends and to invite something that the halakha, the Jewish law, doesn't mandate, that, that an aunt should sit Shiva for a beloved nephew. But in sitting with you and also seeing Yafa there too, who also lost a nephew, we began to explore how powerful it is to be able to be seen, to be able to pause, to be able to process an immense loss, like the loss that your family experienced, the loss of Yakir, of blessed memory. One can only imagine that Moshe Rabbeinu, as the Midrash tells us, wanted to sit in a tent with Aaron and talk about their amazing sister. Remember that time where Miriam, right, was playing with us and she made up nicknames for us. I was Mo and you were Aaron. Remember the time when we disagreed with her but she said, no matter what happens, know that everything is resolved. There is nothing that love doesn't resolve. You can imagine that Moshe wanted at that moment to cry for his sister the way that the text tells us he cried for his brother Aaron 30 days. And that lacune is not just a feminist moment. It's not just a moment for its absence of this remarkable heroine, Miriam, but it's, it's a deep psychological insight. When Moses says, Shimu naha morim, listen, you rebels, the word rebels, morim, is the same letters as the word Miriam, his sister. When he called the Israelites rebels, he was screaming, I want to I wanna talk about my sister Miriam. And all you want from me is more water. It doesn't explain the Torah's punishment. But there is an insight from a rabbi that I read this week that when the Torah says that God said, you didn't make me holy, you didn't make me kadosh, she imagined in her Midrashic mind that God was saying, because we didn't say Kaddish for Miriam, that's why this is taking place. It's a complicated story. And we're living in a time where both of these, both of these Torahs are true. Leaders who are having a hard time adapting and speaking to a next generation that wants a new language and a new way and leaders and people like me and you and all of us who are overwhelmed often by the enormity of what we've witnessed over the past 10 months with no end really in sight. And the Torah invites us to make sure that we give enough space for our sadness and our grief, that we pause long enough to feel the truth of this dislocation that takes place when loss is present, to be human is to lose something at every moment. And to acknowledge that is not to be saccharine or to be melodramatic, but to be authentic and to be real. So I bless all of us in the memory of an incredible nephew for you, Abby. May the Holy One bless you and your family. May she give you the strength and all of us the strength to know what it is to pause, to be rebels with that pause, to rebel with a pause, to slow down, to feel our feelings, 
and to be supportive to others who need that, that extended grace. In that way, we can parch one another's thirst. And from these rocks, we might bring forth water. Amen.